Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. Most people are aware of the enormous warming in the Arctic region. The whole Arctic is getting darker. The albedo, if you like, or reflectivity is dropping because it's getting darker. So it's absorbing more solar radiation and warming like crazy. As this happens, it melts the, the uh, snow cover on the land and the sea ice on the Arctic Ocean. So those are both decreasing extremely rapidly making the Arctic even darker, causing even more warming. These very powerful positive feedback effects are very rapidly taking us to a planet where there's no sea ice and snow cover. So the Arctic will basically equalize in temperature, essentially, or close to it, with the uh, lower latitudes. So the question, the big questions are, what will happen to the jet stream? Will there be a jet stream? What will happen to the weather circulation and atmospheric circulation patterns um, in the Northern Hemisphere? How will the Southern Hemisphere be affected? How will our ability to grow food and get um, drinking water be affected? What type of storms will we um, experience that we weren't experiencing before? So there's all these, all these questions. So in this video, I'm going to as I walk home from my lab here at the University of Ottawa, um, I will walk you through some of the basics of the jet stream, uh, some of its properties, how it's formed, how it's changing um, under climate change, and uh, some of the effects as a result of those changes and where we could be heading. What, what could we expect when there's absolutely no sea ice and snow cover in the Arctic? So these are all um, very important and key questions. So I'll just, uh, like I say, I'll walk you through this as I walk myself out of this building late at night. I think I'm, the janitor was just here a few minutes ago, um, but I think I'm the, uh, about the only person left here. I just have to set the alarm. Hope I got the right number. Okay, so the first uh, question is, you know, what are the jet streams? They're high altitude bands of air that circle the planet. Um, there's generally a subtropical jet stream and a polar jet stream. So those, call them at the uh, subtropical one at about 30 degrees. We'll talk about the northern hemisphere. Things were duplicated pretty much in the southern hemisphere. So 30 degrees north, subtropical, Jet stream, it's, we have a Hadley cell, hot air rises at the equator, moves towards the pole, descends about 30 degrees, so the, there's not much water in that air because it's cooled up above, so as it descends, it's very, it's very dry air, and uh, we have the deserts of the world in those regions, we'll see about 30 degrees. Okay, and then the feral cell connects to the Hadley cell and uh, descends at about 60 degrees, and then we have the uh, polar cell going from 60 to 90. So at these divisions, at these borders between these cells is where we uh, get the jet stream. So basically think of a, par a packet of air from the equator moving uh, northward. So what happens is, why does it move northward? Because air is warmer at the equator, colder at the poles, so the air tends to, you want to equalize temperature, so the air moves poleward. Of course, the Earth is rotating because there, and there's a deflection to the right in the Northern Hemisphere, the Coriolis force. So that air parcel that's moving north deflects to the right. So essentially it reaches a position of equilibrium. So we have the Coriolis force which is pushing it to the right. We have the pressure gradient force, which moves things from high pressure to low pressure. When those forces balance out, turns out that the air motion is parallel to the, um, the uh, iso lines of pressure, the pressure, the isobars. Okay, it's parallel to the, those lines. So basically, it moves from west to east. So the jet streams, um, our high altitude winds close to the top of the lower atmosphere, which is called the troposphere, 
Uh, it's the border, the tropopause is the border between the troposphere and the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere. So the jet streams are there, the air gets confined there, um, held in place by those two forces, which are in balance. And uh, basically, there are waves in the north-south direction, meridional, meridional waves. So that gives you peaks and troughs. Now the jet stream acts as a barrier between very cold and dry Arctic air and uh, much warmer and humid, more southerly air. So what happens as the Arctic is warming like crazy? The temperature gradient to the equator is reduced, so the jet stream actually slows down. It becomes much wavier in the north-south direction, and it can tend to get stuck into place. Now, in, in uh, my previous videos, I showed that there's a condition that's satisf satisfied. N times the wavelength is equal to 2L, where L is the distance around the planet at a particular latitude. So when that condition is, uh, so when N equals six, seven, or eight, in other words, we have three full wavelengths circling the Earth, or three and a half, or four, then the jet stream gets stuck. It can get, it's stuck in these persistent patterns. So storms carrying huge amounts of, uh, of moisture, because we are warming the planet, so the water is warming, it's more evaporation, more water vapor going to the atmosphere, but 7% more water vapor in the atmosphere per degree Celsius increase in temperature. Okay, so these moisture-laden storms are tracking along the jet stream and they're moving more slowly because the jets are moving more slowly, so torrential rain fall in one place, especially if the jets are stuck and we get these, these, uh, persistent pattern. So, you know, a really good example of that is 2010. Pakistan was in the trough of a wave for, you know, over a month. Rain continuously, almost 30 days, 35 days, flooded out three quarters of Pakistan. In the crest of that same wave, same jet stream wave, was Moscow. Heat waves, 30 degrees Celsius plus. They lost 40% uh, of their grain crop, couldn't export, food prices spiked. So these things are very relevant to our society. Okay, so we're losing sea ice and snow cover in the Arctic. Ice is at record lows, didn't really form properly this winter. It's off the charts. Also, same with the ice in Antarctica. It's been setting record minimums. Okay, so where are we heading? We lose more and more sea ice, more and more snow cover, get a much darker and darker Arctic, boom. You know, we lose all the sea ice. Um, could be summer of 2017. Who knows, you know, it's a bit weather dependent. If not, it will be very, very soon, likely before 2020. Okay, so what happens when we lose all sea ice? It's gone for about a couple of weeks or a month in September. The water, everything warms up up there. You know, we have less, we don't, all that energy in the summer doesn't need to go and melt the ice anymore. There's less and less ice, so it heats up the water. We get uh, increased emissions of methane from the terrestrial permafrost, also from the subsea sediments, especially the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf. You know, we're seeing all of these signs with the large um, craters, if you like, in Siberia. You know, sinkholes where the ground just gives way and high levels of methane are detected underneath. So we have these methane clathrates that are in the soils and sediments that are problematic. Of course, the global warming potential of methane is huge. You know, it approaches 150, 200 even. Um, on a few year time scale. And over, uh, over 20 years, it's 86 times that relative to CO2. And it's about 34 times higher than CO2 when you take it over a 100 year um, time scale, which doesn't really make any sense to do that all the time. I mean, the number that's really important is a few years. Okay, so all of these feedbacks cause a lot more warming, more wave action in the Arctic causes mixing, 
brings up warmer water from below. The ice doesn't freeze as well. Within a couple of years, the ice duration, the ice is, the Arctic Ocean is ice free for uh, a month on either side of the September. So August, September, October, you know, another couple of years, add another month on either side, ice free. Within a decade or less, no sea ice in the Arctic year round. We're in a much warmer climate, huge melt rates from Greenland that increase. Hey, we're already seeing massive increases of calving off Greenland. Last week, there were 37 icebergs um, in the North Atlantic shipping lanes off Newfoundland. This week, 450 plus, you know, a huge ramping up. So massive calving from Greenland. You know, it's not surprising. You, you make the Arctic into a sauna and uh, Greenland uh, tosses off chunks of ice. I mean, it doesn't, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to see that. So what happens? So as the, so right now the jet streams are slowing and becoming wavier and they're also moving further north. Okay, we know as the seasons change what the jet streams do. Okay, when the, uh, the jet streams change position during the season. Okay, so they move north and south with the seasons. You know, so as the warming goes on and on and on, the jet streams get weaker and weaker. They get fractured. Their uh, position is more dominated by topography. So mountains, they'll go around mountains, either northward or southward and be stuck in that position. That'll create one of the nodes, if you like, one of the fixed points of the jet. And uh, also they're affected by by the, by the uh, contrast in temperature between the ocean and atmosphere, depending on the season. So as we head into summer, the land is a lot warmer than the oceans initially, right? So air rises over the land, comes in off of the oceans, we get airflow that way, and that reverses um, in the other seasons. So basically the Indian monsoon, you know, in the summer, air is very hot, at the surface of the land over India, it rises up, creates a low pressure area, sucks in cooler, relatively cooler air from the oceans, which is moisture laden. Then that comes on land, rises upward, water vapor condenses, we get the monsoons being on in that case. So the jet streams are very important. They interact, they pull air along and they can disrupt monsoons. They could shut them off. They can uh, interfere with them. But as the jet streams get weaker and weaker and change position, these monsoonal type actions can occur for longer and longer periods of time, leading to torrential rains in places. I mean, just look at uh, parts of Lima, Peru recently, right? The water is extremely warm off the west coast of South America, off Peru. Um, part, you know, it's even indicative of another El Nino possibly occurring and uh, that moisture laden air is going over and flooding vast parts of, uh, of uh, Peru, caused hundreds of deaths, destroyed towns, caused landslides, etc, etc. Okay, so, so uh, what, what can happen when there's no temperature gradient or very little temperature gradient between the equator and the Arctic? In other words, a latitudinal, you know, a very strong feedback is the waviness of the jet streams. It's bringing cold air further south, warm air further, no further north, causing tremendous mixing and equalization of temperatures. So what's very likely is there's a couple of scenarios. The jet streams can vanish completely in the northern hemisphere. That's one option. Um, I think the Arctic will always be slightly cooler than lower latitudes. And uh, so I think there'll be weak jet streams, but they'll be unrecognizable compared to what we have now. Um, very fractured, very broken up, very uh, ineffectual. You know, we could lose a cell. I mean, the Hadley cell, as the Hadley cell position expands northward um, with the warming, you know, we could end up losing, say, the feral cell and just have a two cell system or in the limit, even a one cell system. If, if, if the earth was all ocean, you know, you can talk about a one cell type system. So we're heading into really, uh, we're very, very rapidly heading into very strange times. So please check out my website, paulbeckwith.net and uh, 
follow these videos and uh, we'll continue 